Hello, and welcome to our webinar series. We are going to be talking today about NFTs, also known as non-fungible tokens. I am Sharon Urias. I am the firm's um, IP group practice leader, and I do IP litigation. I'm here with my partner, Justin McNaughton, who does IP registrations. Also with us today is a special guest, Eric Galen, who's a corporate attorney with significant experience in blockchain and NFTs, and he heads up our firm's practice in that area. So with that introduction, Eric, um, I think it'd be useful if we started by you just kind of telling people what NFTs are and, and how they work. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to assume that most of the people watching have some idea what an NFT is, so we're going to keep it very high level and brief. But an NFT is a non-fungible token that exists on a blockchain, um, commonly like Ethereum, but NFTs are being built on many other blockchains now as well. Um, they're non-fungible, which means they are one of one. So unlike something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, where, you know, like a dollar bill, if you have one dollar bill, it's just as good as another dollar bill. A non-fungible token is just non-fungible, right? It, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's unique in some way. So these are typically things like the Bored Ape or the CryptoPunks or Doodles or things like that that have been released. Um, and, uh, and we'll get into this more, but typically at a base level, um, I think it's easiest when talking about some of these issues to think of them almost like digital trading cards. Um, obviously, some NFTs have a lot more functionality and uh, can do a lot more, and some are even tied to physical assets or, or um, have some utility, but at a base level, it's like a digital trading card. And so no two NFTs are the same? No. Okay. And by the way, I should have told the audience, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat, and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, so Eric... Can you talk a little bit about how ownership is typically structured in an NFT issuance? In other words, what we're really getting at here for purposes of this webinar is who owns the IP interests associated sure. with NFT. Sure, so we should unpack it a little bit, right? So when we talk about intellectual property, um, we've got everything from you know trademarks to copyrights to you know you start getting into name and likeness rights and things like that that could be all, all bundled up. So it's a bundle of rights that could be implicated by an NFT. Um, typically speaking, the in a, NFTs, uh, for the most part, so if you think about, again, something like uh, like Doodle, um, you know, the, or a CryptoPunk, um, the, the, the NFT that you buy is a one of one. It was created and issued by the company that, that issued it. And uh, the copyright in terms of ownership you own the NFT, but in terms of who owns the underlying image, for example, um, that really depends on the terms of purchase and the terms of use. So um, Bored Apes, for example, transferred a lot of ownership and a lot of rights to buyers when they released their collection. And there are other NFT collections where the company retains or holds back some or all of the rights. So. It, it completely depends on what your what the terms were when you bought the NFT as to what you could do with them. Right. And, and so, Justin, can you talk a little bit about um, how, you know, ownership of the tokens is transferred? I mean, whether you're talking about licenses or assignments and how that sort of typically is structured. Yeah. So I, and I really liked your the analogy to these are just baseball cards, right? Like they're, they're digital baseball cards, essentially. And I know that Tops is getting into this field. They, you know, I've, I've looked up their trademark registrations to see that. But in that context, like Eric saying, you may have you have to look at the the agreement when the NFT was issued to see if it was an assignment of an intellectual property right or if it was a license mm -hmm. to a particular um, token. And if it's just a, li a license to the token, then what you actually own as a token holder is a license. You have a license for that particular intangible token and to do certain things. If it was issued as ownership, then it gets, then that actually starts to get a little bit wild. Um, and especially when you start looking at different, um, some of these NFTs share common characteristics between them, even though they're all different, they share some common features. 
So it can get really complicated if it's not done properly, because you don't, I mean, the, the worst case scenario would be to basically try to give different people the exact same rights. Um, and, and so you want to be, I think you need to be very careful when you're issuing these. Uh, in terms of, uh, so yeah, so we have, we have what do they own? That's going to be governed by the actual issuing agreement. And then what they can do with it will also be governed by that. And then, so, so these are, you know, people talk in generalities of like, oh yeah, it's an NFT, you have this, this, um, you know, this one of a kind right. And it truly is because there are so much involved in figuring out what everyone has that it's really important to set these up properly um, or eventually we'll, we will see some really, really exciting disputes. Right, but these are all contract-based rights. So it's not a sort of one size fits all um, scenario. And um, Eric, what are you seeing done more commonly? Are you seeing assignments with the transfer of the IP ownership or are you seeing more licenses or does it just really depend on the transaction? I think it totally depends. And I have not seen anything like a survey. I, you know, I certainly have not gone and you know, taken, let's say the top 50 NFTs and said, what, what, what do they do most of the time? Um, someone could certainly do that. But um, I think I'm, I'm seeing, I'm certainly seeing a mix and I'm also seeing issuers um, thinking a lot more deeply about this because they're thinking a lot more about kind of long-term ramifications uh, of ownership, of licensing of rights, what they want to be able to do or prevent people from doing. Um, I mean, it has, you know, the, the, things that seem minor when when they're issued like the terms of terms of purchase or terms of use uh become you know big deals once you have uh, an nft project that could be worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars right so let's talk about some of the i mean we've got copyright and we've got trademark um let's start with trademark let's talk a little bit about some of the issues that come up um when you're talking about trademark rights um i'm happy to feel that yeah so go go for it so these are, this is a really unusual area where um, the NFT issuer is, is most likely the person who has the trademark rights in it, mm -hmm. but, and, and it's pretty unlikely that the person who owns or is licensed an NFT would have any, because a lot, most of the time, the trademark is not actually on the NFT itself. And it's not, um, it's not the same type of you know, it's a trademark, whereas the NFT that's issued is a copyright, most likely, or some other. Right. The NFT of. itself is not a trademark. Right, right. And so you, so the trademark has to be, well, it doesn't have to, but it's probably by the issuer. And so the issuer needs to be taking different considerations about how to control that trademark, um, which is, which is a different analysis in this kind of context where you're giving people exclusive licenses, or you might be assigning something to people. And then how do you control the overall trademark, the quality of what's happening when you're doing that? And it's, it's, it's a very important consideration to have. Especially when you're issuing many, many um, NFTs at once. And has the trademark office kind of caught up and you know, addressed any of these issues or is there any particular class? Um, well, there are several classes and it depends on which, it depends on which part of this you are. If you're, you know, if you're doing tokens of value, which are one thing, then those will be under the financial services class. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, you know, collectible, um, collectible in and of themselves, that's a different class. If you are, um, if you are building out a platform to buy and sell these things, that's a different class. So it really depends. It's like anything else. It depends on what your exact role is in the and how you're using the mark, right? Are you using it to market the platform? Or are you using it to market the actual um, uh, token that's being issued? Um, Eric, are you seeing any issues come up with respect to trademarks or um, mostly copyright, which which we're going to spend some time focusing on? Yeah, it's mostly copyright, not really seeing trademark because typically speaking, you're not seeing people copy, you know, copy, for example, logos or trademarks. Typically what we're seeing is more derivative works where they're infringing on the underlying copyright. Right, I guess unless they're using a brand name associated with 
mm -hmm. um, that, that's owned by somebody else in connection with the issuance. And then that's sort of more of a traditional trademark analysis, I think, that um, something that is specific to this, this actual medium. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. I do, before we move to copyright, though, I do think yeah. one of the big issues that's going to come up is, could, is as between the issuer and the, the token holder mm -hmm. controlling trademark there. Because right. in a traditional trademark context, you have to control how the trademark is used. And this is one of those situations where the, you, the issuer has to sort of stay involved or somehow move that ability to control the trademark somewhere else so that somebody is involved making sure that the trademark is used consistently. So you don't right, and also making sure that if you're not able to control how it's being used down the chain, that it doesn't somehow impair your trademark rights. Right. Um, so those are these are all very complicated questions, I think, and they will ultimately be litigated. Um, should we move on to copyright? Absolutely. All right, Justin. So, so all of a sudden, copyrights are fun again. <laughs> Who would have thought? When would they not? <laughs> like a renaissance in copyright. Yeah. Um, so, a lot. So, the copyright issues that are presented by these NFTs are just fantastic, and and I I think that this is where, as a you know, if you're going to mint a, an NFT, you really have to be thinking about this because. Um, you're going to have, you have to figure out what rights exactly that, that NFT is going to carry, what, what they can and can't do once they purchase this, this token or they license. It's all going to be token. set out in the contract. Right. And if it's not there, um, I mean, that's an interesting issue is if, if that it, it's going to happen, somebody's going to issue one and they're going to have, they're going to have spent, you know, $5 on their contract. And what happens then, right? As these become easier to issue, um, what rights does everybody have? So I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to, to watch, but, but it, as an issuer, I think you have a pretty high duty to really investigate this stuff and make sure that you are clearing it. Just like if you were gonna launch an, um, a Netflix movie, right? The, the clearance that goes involved is involved with that to make sure that you have all the rights you need to um, because if you issue 10,000 tokens or 20,000 tokens and it's infringing on somebody else, that is a... The a, step story damages yeah. could be... It's, but it's a huge mess to undo. It is. But people, I think, need to understand that just by virtue of owning an NFT, you're not automatically granted any intellectual property rights over the work. So it's, you know, if we... It's sort of like buying, as we've talked about before, it's buying a painting. Just because you own the painting doesn't mean that you own the copyright in the artwork and you don't now have the right to make copies of your painting and, and sell it on the open market. Um, and so people need to be very careful um, about, you know, really understanding what they're, what they're acquiring when they purchase these um, or when they're selling them, what, what rights are being transferred and what rights are being retained. Um, do you find, Eric, that, you know, the level of sophistication um, is pretty high in that regard? Level of sophistication in terms of defining rights and, and whatnot? Yeah. I, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, I think that, I think that, that certainly to date, NFT, uh, you know, issuers, creators are typically either more you know on the tech side and on the creative side now these aren't ip lawyers for the most part that are you know, that are that are that are creating the issuing these so uh, in i think that i think that that the companies and the projects are starting to become a lot more aware of how uh complicated the rights can be here and i think are starting to engage with um, you know, lawyers like us who can advise them and help them understand what the implications are and what do they need to have in their, in their terms and, and why they should have those things. And, you know, there's no one size fits all. It really depends on, you know, what, 
what you're trying to do with the NFTs and what's the overall goal of the project and of the company. And um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's still the Wild West. I'm interested to find out, you know, how, so as, as we see these, some of these NFTs that are launched and all of a sudden those images that are supposed to be non-fungible, right? One of a kind are all of a sudden popping up everywhere, right? People are just use, you know, using them in all sorts of, you know, just throwing them onto, I mean, it's kind of like MySpace again, right? And, and how, how, figuring out who can enforce, right? Like, how do we figure out who's actually responsible for enforcement? So if I own or I have a license to this NFT and I've been, you know, promised exclusivity with that, does the, does the issuer have an obligation to make sure that I remain exclusive, that other people aren't using it? How does all that work? And Correct. thinking about that, because chances are that I as an NFT owner or licensee can't do anything about it. It's so, going to diminish the value of your asset. Right. And so if it diminishes the value of my asset, then is my recourse, if I can't go against the person um, who's using it, who's infringing it, do I go back against the issuer? What, how does this work? And what? Um, right. And is the issuer breaching some sort of duty to um, essentially police the IP um, and make sure mm -hmm. that all rights are protected? Right. And, and ultimately, what's the remedy? I mean, we've talked about this before too. It's very interesting because in the traditional world, if somebody is infringing on your intellectual property, um, you go to court, you file your lawsuit, you know what court to go to because you know where the person is located typically, or you can find them. And then you get an order from the court enjoining the other party from using the intellectual property, which means maybe destroying all the you know, infringing goods that they've created or requiring them to take down something from the internet that includes the infringing content. So what, what happens, Eric, in this situation where you've got blockchain technology and I mean, at least my understanding is that that can't be altered. So once it's on that ledger, it's there permanently. Well, Right. Once it's on, I mean, yes, you can't, it's not easy to, you can't simply go on the ledger and, and delete a file, right? So, I mean, if it's to the extent that if it's already been sold and it already exists, you would have to either, you know, for example, go to the platform like an OpenSea or, you know, go to the platform that let's say are selling infringing works and, and try to get them to remove the works and not offer them for sale. Or you could try to figure out, you know, who sort of figure out, you know, who actually is in possession of the NFT and, and go after them. But I think it's gonna be really hard. I mean, I think what you bring up is, is a, it's gonna be increasingly complicated once. So for example, if, if someone's NFTs are stolen and, uh, and then someone tries to you know, sell that NFT in the blockchain, is there, you know, what if anything can you do? And especially when you start thinking about um, you know, international, issues that come up because you know NFT purchasers and buyers can be anywhere in the world um, it gets very complicated so i think we're going to see does. people trying a number of different different methods to try to enforce copyrights or or you know try to recover um stolen nfts and whatnot and the law needs to catch up as it always does and so sort of analogous to this in the context of domain names um, it used to be if somebody registered a domain name and say you're in the United States and the um, infringing party or somebody who hijacks your domain is located in Asia and they're protected by privacy policy, you have no idea how to go after that person. So there is a mechanism to do that through the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, mm -hmm. And you can obtain transfer even if you have no idea who that other person is. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a matter of sort of as I said, catching up with the law and figuring out um, the best way to go after those those people. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Justin, how would we calculate damages? I mean, that, that's an interesting conversation for us to have. I mean, that could take a whole, you know, webinar in itself. Well, and this is one of those situations. So just kind of thinking about this. So statutory damages. So a lot of times the, an infringement is 
one event, right? right. So, so it's per infringement, you could have, you you have a weird situation here where the value, so where statutory damages are less valuable than the actual damages suffered. So a lot of times when you have statutory damages are useful, so statutory damages are an alternative, right? And it's a concept where somebody's selling, um, I mean, basically somebody's selling something on eBay and it's fake, right? Like the old, I mean, and or on Amazon and it's fake. Well, typically your actual damages won't cover the cost of the demand letter, right? Let alone the, the trouble. So you have this concept of statutory damages to get you a higher amount of damage. But in this instance, there are some weird instances where if somebody launched an infringing NFT, the actual damages might dwarf those um, the statutory damages available. Statutory they might, damages but doesn't it depend on how many are issued? Because if it's per yeah. infringement, you know, so if they issue 10,000, for instance, infringing NFTs, then you'd get statutory damages for each one of those 10,000. Uh, uh, depending on what your work is that's being infringed. So if right. you, assuming it's a registered uh, copyright, it could be one infringement, in which case I, 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 we don't know yet. I mean, that's what I would argue if, if I represented the infringing party that, that the issuance is one event and it's one infringement. Right. Um, so, so there, there are lots of, I mean, this is, it's just be, because of the confluence of all the different intellectual property things that are happening here and in the nature of how distributed the rights are is what makes these so, so fascinating and so interesting to watch. It is. So yeah. we've got, um, we have about, you know, seven to 10 minutes left and we've got a few questions. Um, the first one is if client owns a painting purchased prior to this NFT world, does the artist still own the right to issue an NFT of the same artwork? I'll I can take that one. Yeah, go for so, it. So the answer is, is that if, um, let's say most of you don't know, but Galen, uh, Eric Galen, you know, is a famous watercolor painter. This is what he does in his spare time, right? If somebody, so he has copyrights in all of these, um, these landscape watercolors. Right. If because somebody, just, yeah, so he, he owns the copyright in those paintings. If somebody just takes his artwork and issues an NFT on it, Eric absolutely has the right to sue them for all of their profits to get an injunction to stop it. And now he has some prerequisites that he'll have to do before he can do that. But it's the exact same because these NFTs in that case would be derivative works or infringing works of his original um, artwork. So that's why it's so important to clear these and do clearance searches and make sure that you're not infringing because if you issue 10,000 or 20,000 NFTs that are infringing, that wow. <laughs> will be way more trouble. Than right, yeah. I mean, so, so to answer the question, yes, Eric owns the copyright in his paintings. So he has the right to issue an NFT of his same artwork. If someone else wants to issue an NFT of his artwork, they need to go to Eric um, and, clear, and, and work that out with him. Right. and get a license or an assignment or something along those lines. Right, and I, and I think that it's the same answer, or I think it's for the next question, which I think was, I think Sammy Tauber asked mm -hmm. uh, regarding copyrights and 3D avatar PFPs based on a canon. So Sam, I'm assuming what, what that, what the question is, is let's say you're saying, if I bought a board ape uh, NFT and then I, I created a 3D, rendering of that and then wanted to sell that, are there any issues? And the answer is yes, because it's that those would be derivative works. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't own it, but depending again, Board Apes actually transferred rights. So if you had the right, the copyright in the NFT to begin with, then you could do that. But assuming that you don't, then no, you would have to, you would have to go get a license from the, uh, the copyright holder. But if I can take that question one step further, which is that when you're about to issue an NFT, these are the things you should be thinking about because mm -hmm. that NFT might, the NFT by itself might be worth, you know, a good chunk of change. But 
the ability to control or, or the ability to create the secondary market for these NFTs may dwarf the original issuance and being very clear about who controls that. Because in some ways, if that's transferred to the NFT holder, it sort of destroys the right because then it will become impossible for 20,000 different people to ever agree on anything. Right, and there's sort of a, a follow-up to that question, Eric. I don't know if you saw um, that the creator writing an IP story canon franchise and issues 3D avatar PFPs to NFT holders, would you license the IP to the holders? Sorry, I'm just now seeing that. Where, where yeah. is that? Where's that oh. one? The creator writing an IP story franchise and issues 3D avatar to NFT holders. I'm not sure I totally understand. I'm not sure I do either, but the bottom line is that the creator of the work holds the IP interest. I mean, you have to go with that as just sort of a starting point. And so if you do not own the copyright, then you need to get a license or an assignment from the copyright holder in, in any context, um, whether it's NFT context or um, the sort of real tangible world. Um, right. Let's would, move on to- no, This would be no different than taking somebody's image and printing a whole bunch of t-shirts. Exactly. I, I think we should move on to another question. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. If there are hundreds or thousands of variations of an NFT, how do we register so many variations for copyright? Costs can be prohibitive. Yeah, that's, that's something that Justin and I are actually dealing with with the client right now, looking at this issue, and uh, it can be prohibitive. Uh, one of the things, sometimes with some of these NFT projects, what we're seeing is that there are, let's say, a very small set of core attributes or core images, and that oftentimes, um, the the others are kind of based or derivative works based on the core images. So one of the things that you might be able to do is just copyright the core images and and then try to be able to basically rely on the copyright and the core images to be able to enforce violations of all the other kind of derivative NFTs. Uh, but yeah, as of now, Justin, you can talk about this. There's no quick, simple, easy way to let's say go register. 10,000 copyrights for NFTs. This is, I mean, this is a problem. I would say this is a problem that is often encountered um, by creators of multiple works, of vast works, of photographs. Um, you sort of have to pick and choose what the most important um, works are for you if you don't have an unlimited budget, and most of us don't, um, as to what you're going to register. Copyrights themselves are not expensive. It's not a difficult process to do, but it is time consuming. And, and Justin, what's the turnaround right now in the Copyright Office? Oh, it's, it's not bad for the Copyright Office. Usually, you know, it's months rather than years. Okay, uh, so that so, hasn't increased because of right, COVID? Not for the Copyright Office, um, not noticeably. The Trademark Office has, but so, but here, this can all be resolved by, by your, your agreements. Mm -hmm. All of these things can be dealt with in your agreements. Mm -hmm. And it's important because if people know what it is that they can and can't do and what it is they are and are not getting, um, then it, it works. I mean, here's one scenario I could see. One scenario I could see is you're about to issue these things. You don't know what or how valuable they're gonna be. You can build into your agreement the right that anybody who buys it can sort of pay the money and, and ask you to register the copyright in their particular one or something like that. Like that would be perfectly reasonable. And then everybody who owns the tokens can decide, you know, if they think it's worth the, the, the minimal filing fee where it's, it might be a filing fee that's prohibitive on a scale of doing 50,000. But if somebody has one token, it's, it's, you distribute that cost. So I'm not saying that's the best idea, but there are lots there, of there ways, ways, to, there are ways to deal with it. And the bottom line is if you deal with it up front, then you don't have to worry as much on the back end. Justin, here's a question that I particularly yeah. like. Um, I, this, okay, go ahead. Justin, can you please further explain your position as to one infringement? Because I subscribe to the same legal analysis as Sharon. So, okay. We're talking about the damages calculation. Yeah. So if, um, so if somebody has registered a single copyright that includes all 10,000 images, 
and then somebody issues an infringing um, an infringing NFT issuance, right? So the, that collection is a derivative work of the original collection. I think there's a pretty good argument that's a single infringement. But now, isn't, the, isn't the infringement the purchase of the infringing NFT? And so then you would have, if, if you had 10,000 separate purchasers, wouldn't that be 10,000 separate infringing events? I mean, it, that's, it could that's be. The, it yeah, could so, be, um, but that's. But I think it depends on. Part of it depends on what you've registered. Right. It would. Whether, um, as to how that would work, and and whether it's all. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't know. No, if it's, an open, it's an open. It's an open question, right? Right. If, if this is all considered one sale, or if it's considered ten thousand sales, or if it's how that works, but it is not an easy. I don't. I do not think it's an easy. Um, it's an easy answer, and, and I'm I if I was an infringing, um, an infringing issuer, I would certainly be arguing that it was one. But, Absolutely, and so <clears throat> we're actually out of time. Um, this is a very yeah. interesting topic. There's a lot of material to cover, and I would encourage um, any of the attendees, if you have any questions, to please feel free to email myself, Justin, or Eric, and we'll be happy to um, talk to you offline. Thank you for attending and we'll see you next time.